Good day, everybody. I am Sulma Stein. I am the Managing Director of SSLR Incorporated. We are a property law firm specializing exclusively in rentals and evictions, which I suppose is a very interesting field of specialization. And I am honored today to share this webinar with you as property practitioners about the things we're currently seeing in the industry that might be extremely relevant to you. So the focus of my session today is simply around something that we are currently seeing in the industry. We are seeing a lot of cancellations of lease agreements. And you might be thinking for you as a property practitioner, how does this impact you? Obviously, not just the frustration of a landlord canceling a lease agreement and how does that work? How do you explain that to the tenant and what's the effect on the tenant? Or if a tenant does an early cancellation in terms of section 14 of the CPA, how does that impact you? What does that look like and how should you handle that? Not just that, actually more importantly, let's all talk about the bottom line. How does that impact your income? How does that impact your commission, your revenue stream? If the tenant or the landlord does an early cancellation for whichever reason. So let's start at the beginning, I find that that's usually a very good place to start. Let's start at the beginning. What does cancellation look like? And why are we currently seeing a lot more cancellations of lease agreements? <clears throat> and what's the reason for these cancellations? So obviously at this stage, the economy is strained. We all know about this. We've all experienced this. And we do know this is not just coming out of, of COVID and the effect COVID had on our economy but a lot of other factors and uh, we can definitely talk about load shedding and the effect of the economy um, on the economy of, uh, of load shedding. And we are currently in a strained economic system. So a lot of tenants will have to cancel their lease agreements because they simply can't afford the rental. Or on the other hand, a lot of landlords cancel lease agreements because they simply cannot afford to hold that secondary property. They can't afford the pump costs, their rates and taxes and things like that. So what does that look like for us? How does this work? And what is the impact of this on our, on our situations? So cancellation by the tenant, very important. This is in terms of the Consumer Protection Act. If the Consumer Protection Act does not apply to a lease agreement, a tenant does not have the right to do this early cancellation. When will Section 14 of the CPA apply? This is absolutely crucial to be aware of. There's a perception in the industry, especially under um, tenants as well as, as property practitioners, unfortunately, that a tenant can cancel at any time. And it's almost as if the application of Section 14 of the CPA goes completely out of the window and people just assume a tenant can cancel early. That is not the case. The only time a tenant will have the right <clears throat> to do an early cancellation is in a situation where, first of all, there must be a fixed term lease agreement in place. A verbal ag agreement is valid and highly enforceable. Remember the um, Rental Housing Amendment Act has not been promulgated yet. So, all these agreements may very well be verbal lease agreements. They are equally enforceable. Important to be aware of in these circumstances is if you have a verbal agreement or if you have a written lease agreement and it ran out of the fixed time period and it's now on a month-to-month -month basis, those lease agreements can never be fixed term agreements. They are all periodic leases. They are month-to-month -month agreements. So whether there was a lease, written agreement in place in the past or whether there was nothing in place, all of this has always been verbal agreements. These agreements can never, ever, ever be governed by Section 14 of the CPA for the very simple reason that obviously the first requirement for Section 14 of the CPA to apply is that it must be a fixed term consumer agreement. This is absolutely essential. It's important to be aware of this. If you now have a fixed term lease agreement, important to know the next requirement 
centers around the parties to the agreement. There's a misperception in the industry that if your um, landlord is a, a natural person and the tenant's a juristic entity, in that case, section 14 of the CPA will not apply. That's incorrect. You will have to look at the landlord in a bit more detail, but for safety's sake, and I would apply this across the board, is if either one of the parties, be it the landlord or the tenant, is a natural person, so in their personal capacity, rather err to safety side and assume that section 14 of the CPA will apply. If it doesn't, and there is a situation where the landlord's asset value or annual turnover could be more than the threshold of 2 million uh, rand per annum, please make sure, pick up the phone, call SSLR, you're always welcome to make contact with us, promise you won't pay a cent for a quick checkup like that. Have the conversation, find out before you assume section 14 does not apply. So what I'm saying, fixed term agreement and both parties are juristic entities, section 14 of the CPA will not apply. Fixed term agreement, either one of your parties is a natural person, be it landlord or tenant, urge you safety side and assume section 14 will apply. Only in these circumstances. So only where you have a fixed term agreement, natural person in, in the transaction, if it's a, the tenant, it's a given that section 14 will apply. Then the tenant does have this right set out in section 14 of the CPA. It says, if a consumer agreement is for a fixed term and despite the provisions of the agreement to the contrary. So even if the lease agreement says the tenant may not cancel midterm or the tenant may cancel the agreement, but only on three months written notice. The Act says we don't care what the lease agreement says. If it's a fixed term agreement, then the consumer being the tenant will have the right to cancel the agreement at any time by giving the supplier 20 business days notice. This is crucial. What we see often is tenants doesn't want to take occupation. So he signed the lease, everybody was happy. And Suddenly, when he gets to the property, when he's supposed to take occupation, he says, no, 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 you know what? I don't want to take occupation anymore. Or three months into a 12-month lease agreement, suddenly he gives a two-week notice and he says, I am out. I am enforcing my rights in terms of uh, the Consumer Protection Act to cancel. The requirements very clear that the consumer, so the tenant, must give the supplier, the landlord, 20 business days notice. Immediate cancellation or a cancellation on a notice period shorter than 20 business days isn't in terms of this clause. And that means that the landlord would be able to claim all the damages he suffers without a limitation to that. Every actual damage that he suffers that he can prove, he will be able to claim. It's only in a circumstance when a tenant gives clear 20 business days notice of cancellation that he would be entitled to now only pay the early cancellation penalty. What is this early cancellation penalty? How much? What is the story around this? There is no limitation on the early cancellation penalty. There's no prescribed limitation in terms of the CPA. Industry-wise, at this stage, um, average seems to be between two and four months rental. But remember, uh, conventional penalty act gets in and it also says you're not allowed to claim a penalty that is greater than the actual damages suffered. So if you say, for instance, your negotiation range for your early cancellation penalty is between two and four months rental, fantastic property practitioners, please keep in mind that your commission or the prorated commission that you now, um, that the landlord doesn't have a benefit of that claim is exclusively in the landlord's hands. You, as the property practitioner, you have a written mandate, I hope, and your written mandate will now say, what happens when the lease agreement gets cancelled? You will be entitled to your procurement, uh, your procurement commission, but obviously your management commission. You won't be able to claim management commission if there isn't a tenant to manage in the property. So your procurement commission is still uh, payable but by the landlord. So the landlord has to pay it and the landlord now has the right to reclaim that amount that he paid to you as the property practitioner back from the tenant. 
whether the money actually exchanged hands or not at the time of cancellation is irrelevant. It's all based on your mandate agreement because at the point of cancellation, and we'll talk a lot about that a little later in this session, the landlord must pay you your full procurement commission even if he didn't have a tenant at that time. And for that reason, he will have a claim against the tenant. So please make sure your lease agreement doesn't say something like uh, the early cancellation penalty will only be one month's rent because what if you can't find a tenant in that month and there is prorated commission that the landlord will have to claim. Now you've limited yourself to one month's rent and the damages that the landlord suffer might very well be greater. You will know from uh, the, the most used, uh, wide, widest used lease uh, currently in South Africa, you know that there is typically a, a negotiation almost a time period. So it says the minimum cancellation penalty and the maximum cancellation penalty. And typically what we complete there at this stage is minimum two months, maximum four to six months, depending on your area. If you're in an area like Cape Town right now, where stock is actually pretty low and the market is, uh, as soon as the property opens up, you have placed a new tenant. Even if that is the case, make sure you don't say one month, minimum one month, um, and a maximum of two months that limits your, uh, yourself too much rather than stick to something like a maximum of three months but still keep your minimum at a minimum of two months if you're in an area where stock is moving very slowly and there's almost an oversupply of rentals of rental properties leave yourself some negotiation room while the landlord some negotiation room and rather say a minimum of two months rent for your early cancellation penalty and a maximum of six months because the landlord is entitled to claim the full damages that he is suffering due to the tenant's early cancellation but limited to the maximum cancellation penalty that we agree to in terms of the lease agreement. <clears throat> Very important in this conversation is the early cancellation penalty. The Act does deal with things we need to consider and things we need to Keep in mind, in determining what a reasonable early cancellation penalty would look like, importantly, if the lease agreement says, we agree that this early cancellation penalty is in fact a fair penalty and we give it a negotiation range, the chances that somebody could come back and say, no, 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 but that's not fair, would be silly because the tenant agreed this scope two to four months or two to six months <clears throat> would be a reasonable scope. If that is the case, obviously the tenant won't be able to say, but that wasn't reasonable. You agreed at inception of the lease agreement that that would be fair. You invoice this early cancellation penalty at the point of cancellation. But remember, the tenant is liable for all the costs up to the point of cancellation. So he's paying rent. During the notice period, the notice period, even if it's longer than 20 business days, the tenant is still liable to pay rent during that time period. The cancellation penalty is only charged at the point of cancellation. So even if he gives two or three months rent uh, notice and he still has to pay rent in that time, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have to pay the early cancellation penalty. It does mean that the landlord has a longer time period to mitigate these damages and the landlord does have an obligation to start marketing the property immediately when he receives the notice. But a longer than 20 business days time period does not take the tenant's obligation to pay the early cancellation penalty away. If say for instance, the tenant gave two months notice and he paid rent during the notice period at the point of cancellation, the um, landlord invoice or the uh, property practitioner invoice for the early cancellation penalty, but you are able to place a tenant immediately when, it, uh, when the previous tenant exits, yes, the landlord's damages would be less, but he will still suffer damages because he had to pay procurement commission for the entire time period. So you can't claim the new tenant's placement commission from the exiting tenant you're going to claim the full period procurement commission for the exiting tenant. But importantly, yeah, 
because you were able to place a new tenant, the landlord's not going to suffer a loss of income. So you can't claim those months rental. But what you can do is the prorated procurement commission that the landlord paid to the property practitioner, that can still be deducted. And the, the landlord will have to refund the tenant from the early cancellation penalty for the time period that he actually doesn't suffer damages. So you only allow to claim the actual damages suffered, whether that's loss of income, whether that is procurement commission, prorated procurement commission where you didn't have the tenant um, actually in the property for the commission that you paid. It's important to know that even though you're able to place a tenant as soon as the cancelling tenant exits the property, the landlord will still suffer damages and he is very much allowed to claim that. He won't claim the, the loss of income, but he is entitled to claim the prorated procurement commission. So that's cancellation by the tenant. It was a long, heavy part of the session. And if you think that was long and heavy, watch this part coming your way now. Cancellation by the landlord. So there's a massive conversation going on in the industry right now around, can a landlord cancel a lease agreement midterm? Yes, most definitely he can. Section 14 of the Consumer Protection Act does not say that a landlord may only cancel a lease agreement should the tenant be in breach of the agreement. A landlord can only cancel in terms of Section 14 of the Consumer Protection Act when a tenant is in breach of the lease agreement. That is very true. And the landlord will have to give the tenant 20 business days to remedy his breach. And only if the tenant doesn't would the landlord be allowed to cancel that lease agreement. A landlord can't give a tenant 20 business days notice of cancellation when the tenant already remedied his breach. Most definitely, I agree with that 100%. But there's another act that's very relevant, and that is the Rental Housing Act. The Rental Housing Act and the Consumer Protection Act run side by side, and it governs different elements of our transaction. So yes, Section 14 of the CPA says, when a tenant is in breach of a lease agreement, this is the way we need to handle that situation. We need to give him 20 business days notice to remedy his breach before we can cancel. Very important. However, we do have Section 4, Subsection 5, Subsection C of the Rental Housing Act. Very important, guys. Please keep in mind, these acts, they, they're not contradicting one another, not at all. They're just catering for different scenarios. In this particular instance, it deals with a scenario where the landlord will have to cancel the lease agreement midterm, so during the subsistence of the lease, when the tenant is not in breach of the lease agreement for a few specific reasons. Now, the reason why the Rental Housing Act does this is, yes, a tenant wants to be in occupation of a property for a very specific time period. Very important um, that he does have the right to remain in occupation for that time period. But the legislator recognize the need for a landlord to sometimes be able to cancel that lease agreement even in a situation where the tenant is complying with his obligations. Best tenant you've ever seen does the maintenance, looks after the property perfectly, pays his rent on time, everything is perfect, but there is still a need for the landlord to cancel this lease agreement. And he can, even if Section 14 of the CPA applies this piece of legislation, applies at the same time. It's not contradicting anything, not contradicting the CPA, and it is very much not contradicting the principle of Heer God Verkoop, which, by the way, is still very much an enforceable legal principle where it says when there's a lease agreement in place, a property gets sold on transfer, the purchaser becomes the landlord. That is very much still um, a very recognized thing in our law. It's common law principle, so you can contract out of that. It's not the wisest thing to contract out of it because you do have Section 45C of the Rental Housing Act catering for a situation where the landlord have to cancel the lease agreement midterm. So Section 45C says um, the landlord's right against the tenant includes his or her rights to, and you will see from sub 
subsection A, all the way through to E, it deals with these rights that a landlord has against the tenant. Remember, Section 5 of the Rental Housing Act deals with the relationship between the landlord and the tenant. This one specifically deals with the landlord's rights against the tenant. And it says that the landlord has the right to terminate. Please note the word terminate, not cancel. Yeah, this is very relevant. Cancellation is usually on the back of bridge. Termination is this brings this lease agreement just to an end calmly and peacefully. The landlord has the right to terminate the lease agreement in, in respect of a rental housing property on grounds that do not constitute an unfair practice and are specified in the lease. Very important. So two requirements that we see here. First of all, if this provision is not in your lease agreement, if the lease agreement does not allow the landlord to cancel the lease agreement during the subsistence of the lease, the landlord cannot rely on this particular clause. So landlords, tenants, and please property practitioners, ensure that your lease agreement does contain a clause that allows for cancellation by the landlord even in a situation when a tenant is not in breach of the agreement. Very importantly now, it says the reason for cancellation may not constitute an unfair practice. So a landlord may never cancel a lease agreement in a situation where he just wants higher rent or he just doesn't want to follow the correct process um, to, to get a non-paying tenant out or he just doesn't like the tenant, whatever the case might be. The only real reasons that would not constitute an unfair practice would be in a situation where the landlord has to sell the property and he would not be able to get the purchase price that he needs if the tenant is in place. So it might be a property that's not in a high investor area and it is actually a property that has to be sold as a primary residence. In that situation, there is very good grounds for the landlord to cancel or in a situation where the landlord will have to take occupation of the property. So for instance, it's a couple that had two properties, they were married, they are going through divorce, one of the parties will have to take occupation of that property. The landlord had multiple properties and he can't afford it, something bad happened, the economy hit him in the wrong direction and he has to take occupation himself of this property. As long as this reason is real, it does not constitute an unfair practice the landlord would have the right to cancel the lease agreement midterm, even where the tenant is not in bridge. These two pieces of legislation is not contradicting. One does not pre take precedent over the other. The Consumer Protection Act does take precedent to, to other legislation, but these two pieces of legislation aren't in contrast. The one deals with cancellation, where the tenant is in bridge, and the other deals with the landlord's right to cancel the agreement even when the tenant is not in bridge. So I hope that makes sense. And very important, you will note from this piece of legislation, the Act does not give a specific time period. So it's crucial for the parties to agree to that. I personally feel it's fair and reasonable and the courts seem to agree with me on this one on two months notice. But please be, be mindful of the fact that the Act does not require a specific time period. Your lease agreement must, 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 must cater for that. Property practitioners, please keep in mind, if you remove a clause that gives a, ten, a landlord this right to cancel the lease agreement and you do not have the conversation with the landlord, you do not get an instruction in writing to remove that right from the landlord, it is unfortunately unprofessional conduct because you are mandated on behalf of the landlord, you're representing the landlord. Yes, the Property Practitioners Act says we need to consider the rights of both parties. That doesn't mean we can take a right away from one of the parties, especially the party you're mandated by, without the landlord's written instruction. If you do that and the landlord has to cancel and he can't because you have unilaterally removed that clause, unfortunately, that is definitely unprofessional conduct to so be very mindful of this. But why is this relevant? And what does this look like? to you and your commission as a property practitioner. The effect of sale or cancellation on your mandate agreement, as much as the principle of Jürgen for Koop says that the lease agreement continues. Remember you as the property practitioner is in fact not a party to the lease agreement. You can never be as much as your lease agreement need to warrant that you do have a valid FFC in terms of section 67 of the uh, Property Practitioners Act. 
you're not a party to the proceeding. You're not a party to that contract. So as much as the lease agreement continues, the mandate agreement unfortunately doesn't. Soon as the property is sold, the purchaser may now elect to terminate. Well, the, the mandate will automatically terminate, but the purchaser may elect to remandate you or to not mandate you or mandate a random other agency is 100% entitled to that. If your sale agreement or your lease agreement uh, forces the purchaser to keep you on, on a management mandate, unfortunately, that is unenforceable and at the best of times, um, uh, uh, contrary to so, so many laws. So the, the purchaser is very much allowed not to mandate you, mandate his own agent or uh, manage his own property. Very important. When a lease agreement is cancelled, obviously, you, you were paid, you're supposed to have been paid your procurement commission at the time of inception of the contract. We know that very often property practitioners absorb the procurement commission into the manage, the management commission into the procurement commission or procurement commission into the management commission. Guys, I am begging you. Mandate agreements. Long disputes around should it be in writing, shouldn't it only sole mandates. The truth is, this is the basis of your relationship between you as the property practitioner and the landlord. If you do not have this document in writing, you are basically relying on somebody to pay you without actually having an agreement governing that. It's important, guys, to have your mandate agreements in writing. Whether we have this argument around does the act require us to have it in writing or not? It's irrelevant. It is your income. It's your salary. And to be honest, I wouldn't be working for a company if my employment contract's not in writing. So I don't know about you, <clears throat> my mandate agreement. I was a property practitioner would definitely be in writing. <clears throat> if you have this and you have procurement commission and management commission and you're absorbing one into the other, please make sure that you quantify your procurement commission. Why? On sale, where your mandate gets ended, on cancellation of the lease agreement, where your mandate automatically ends, if you've absorbed one into the other, you won't have a proper clear claim against the landlord. The landlord, without that claim, doesn't have a clear claim against the tenant on cancellation. So it's very important, guys. If you have a placement fee, procurement fee, and you have a management fee. And you say to the landlord, don't worry, Mr. Landlord, you don't have to pay that fee. You just pay me a monthly management amount. Please make sure you have a special condition in your mandate agreement that says, if this mandate agreement comes to an end for whichever reason, obviously, unless you as the property practitioner are in breach of the agreement, very important. And to keep in mind that you need to be able to say, if this happens and we, my mandate comes to an end, you, Mr. Landlord, will have to pay me my full procurement fee. Also, if you cancel my mandate and you continue to manage the relationship between you and the tenant yourself, every, every renewal, I am entitled to my renewal procurement commission. If you don't have that in your mandate, you won't be able to claim that money from the landlord. Yes, you would. It's easy enough to prove effective cause. But do we really want to litigate on these things? It doesn't make sense at all. To go to court just because you can win something in court doesn't mean it makes financial sense to go through a two, three-year litigation to prove that you were entitled to this, whatever the amount is claimed. On sales, it makes a lot more sense. On rentals, guys, let's be clever about this. Keep our mandates in writing. Make sure that when the lease agreement comes to an end for whichever reason, when your mandate comes to an end for whichever reason, you have actually secured your procurement commission and you will be able to carry on collecting that money from the landlord for the work that you've done. Because the work that you've done was to bring this relationship into being between the landlord and tenant and you are most definitely entitled to your commission on that. I hope. I have touched on a few important points for you. I really hope that it's of value to you. And I really hope that thinking about our mandate agreements, thinking about 
how we actually make money as property practitioners, that it is not just fair and reasonable to the landlord, but to you as well. As property practitioners, you guys work extremely hard and there is no reason in this world for you not to be entitled to collect your reasonable commission. Even in a situation where the tenant or the landlord cancels the lease agreement or when the landlord <clears throat> sells the property and, I'm sorry, load shedding, and <clears throat> in a situation where you are then um, in a position where the purchaser doesn't carry on with the mandate agreement, you should be entitled to collect that money for the work that you have done. Like I said, I am Silma Stein from SSLR Incorporated. We are always <clears throat> there for the industry, very happy to help. Pick up the phone, contact us. If you have any questions, we are there to support the industry. And I hope you guys have a lot of happy rental stories coming out of this. Have a fantastic day further.